Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Emmanuel for our divine worship service this morning. As we begin our opening service, or as we open our service this morning, we'll begin with the opening responsive prayer printed on the first page of your bulletin. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God. For he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels, Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Amen. Join in our opening hymn, hymn 616, verses 1 through 4. beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. sinners confess unto you that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against you by thought, word, and deed. Wherefore we plead for refuge to your infinite mercy, seeking and imploring your grace for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. O most merciful God, who has given thy only begotten Son to die for us, have mercy upon us, and for his sake, grant us remission of all our sins. And by thy Holy Spirit, increase in us true knowledge of thee, and of thy will, and true obedience to thy word, to the end that by thy grace we may come to everlasting life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy upon us, and has given his only Son to die for us and for his sake. 
forgives us all our sins. To those who believe in his name, he gives power to become the children, the Son of God, and has promised them his Holy Spirit. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. Grant this, Lord, unto us all. chapter 22, verse 17. Alleluia! The Spirit and the Bride say, Come. Let the one who hears say, Come. Let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires take the water of life without price. Alleluia! <laughs> us to trust in you for our salvation. Deal with us not in the severity of your judgment, but by the greatness of your mercy. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. You may be seated for the scripture reading. overarching theme for this whole Sunday is the joys of heaven, and the joys of heaven which are often described as a feast, a free feast which God throws for each one of us, as long with that eternal life are all the other blessings that God gives us, all of which are always described as being completely free through his son Jesus Christ. So our Old Testament reading comes from Isaiah chapter 25, verses 6 through 9, in which this wonderful, delicious meal is described, along with all of the blessings which the Lord promises us. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, a rich food full of marrow, of aged wine, well refined. And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in this salvation. So far, God's holy word. Another thing that the Lord promises us, and he gives us for free, is this peace, which surpasses all our human understanding. Peace which does this because it's peace between the perfect God and the sinful man. A peace which we couldn't come up with by ourselves. And yet the Lord gives it to us for free. We read our epistle reading from Philippians chapter 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, 
whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at length you have, received, you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. This is the word of the Lord. Please rise as we join in confessing our Christian faith according to the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. You may be seated for the next hymn, hymn 799, out of your tan worship supper.
Let us pray. Lord, to whom else shall we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. Amen. Text for our consideration this morning comes from Matthew chapter 22. We read the first 14 verses. And again Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son and sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. Again he sent other servants, saying, Tell those who were invited, See, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them. Now the king was angry, and he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go, therefore, to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. And those servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. So far God's holy word. Dear friends in Christ, before we get to the parable for this morning, I'd like to lay a question upon your hearts, and it's a question I'd really like you to think about. It's the world's most important question, and it's one I'll address by the end of this sermon. The question is this, and I really want you to think about it. If you were standing before God on Judgment Day, and he looked at you and he said, Why should I let you into heaven? What would your answer be? Think about that. Why should God let you into heaven? Give him one reason. What reason would that be? I just want that to simmer on your minds here. And we'll jump into our parable. In our parable this morning, Jesus describes heaven as a wedding feast. This is a pretty common description of heaven throughout Scripture. We saw it in our Old Testament reading where he described heaven as being a feast full of delicious meat and fine, well-aged wine. Elsewhere, Jesus describes his relationship with us, his church, as being a marriage. A marriage between the groom and his, and his bride, the church. I think the reason why oftentimes... Jesus describes heaven as being a feast and our relationship as a marriage is because that's a pretty apt description of what heaven will probably be like. I don't think it's too far-fetched to say that might be the case. And what a wonderful description of heaven a wedding feast is then. A feast where we all gather together, enjoy one another's company, we celebrate a great happening, celebrate with Wonderful food, all of our favorite things. Yeah, that might not be that far off from what heaven is like. As far as our marriage to Christ, as his bride, the church, that's a pretty great description as well. Ideally, if it wasn't a sinful world, ideally a marriage is where one person gives up of themselves to the other, where one person puts his or her interests second in line behind the other's, and in love, sacrifices for the other person. That would be the ideal world. But that's exactly what Christ did in his marriage to us. Gave up of himself for our sakes, in love, put his own interests behind, and sacrificed himself for his church. Talk about love. So yes, a wedding, a wedding feast, these are actually really great descriptions of what heaven 
will be like. And just in general, thinking of heaven as a feast is a great illustration for us because we like food. We like to eat. Some of our happiest times on earth are around food, whether it be a potluck after church, or it be a, a meal on Christmas or Thanksgiving, or just dinner out with friends, or a date night with a significant other. Yeah, food generally makes us happy. And we know in heaven it's going to be the greatest, greater than all these things. And he describes it in such wonderful terms as he did in Isaiah. A, f- a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, a rich food full of marrow. And he's giving all of this to us for free. He told us in our thematic verse, come without money, come and buy wine and milk. This is all ours for free. And that leads us to our theme for this morning. Who wouldn't want to attend this feast? It's really a rhetorical question. We don't have to answer it because, I mean, obviously the answer is no one. Everyone should want to attend this feast, the greatest feast ever thrown, an eternal feast for free. Yet sadly, as we look through our sermon text, we find that's just not the case. Sadly, there are many who don't really care about the heavenly feast that God has prepared. So we'll begin starting with verse 2. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son, and he sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. So it's very apparent from the beginning that the king, this is God the Father. The prince, this is Jesus, God the Son. And this king in the parable, God, he throws a feast for his son, throws a feast, and he invites all these people from the village And yet we run into some unexpected behavior. The people aren't interested. The people decide they won't go. Now, that's not too uncommon in our day and age. If you throw a wedding reception, you might invite a couple hundred people, maybe three quarters, maybe half of those people show up. A lot of people just can't go or maybe don't have the time to attend. In these days, however, it was quite a bit different. See, a king, when he's throwing a wedding feast, This is a big deal. Wedding feasts in general at those times, they weren't just a couple hours at a reception hall. And they were were full week-long affairs with with great food the entire week long. And you think about a king throwing one of these wedding feasts. Talk about the best. A full week of the best food, the best wine, the best anything that money could buy. All provided for free by this king to his guests. This is really a a who's who event. And yet then, how strange it is that all these guests receive this invitation for this great feast, and they say, no, I'm okay. Who wouldn't want to go to that feast? Yet sadly, many did not want to go. Looking at this historically, Jesus is speaking first and foremost about the Jewish people that he had come to and that the invitation was to initially. And yet, that was the response. No, we're fine, Lord. We don't need your heavenly feast. And then thinking about the work of the kingdom of God in our day and age, we see the same reaction time and time again. The Lord invites Sinners like us to his heavenly feast. And so many are just not interested in responding to the invitation. Picking up back at verse 4. Again, he sent other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I've prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. So we see the long-suffering of this king. He's invited all these people, and they've all refused every single one of them. But he doesn't stop there. He goes back. He re-extends the invitation to them, hoping that they'll accept. In the same way, we see 
the Lord's gracious attitude towards sinners. How the Lord does not give up on people. The Lord continues to send his invitation out. Because God desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth, so he suffers long with people like us who are so stubborn and refusing to listen to his invitation. And he continues to go out and send that invitation to us. You see this gracious king, this gracious Lord, throwing this feast, giving us a second chance. Who wouldn't attend that feast? Well, again, we run into an unexpected answer. Verse 5. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them. Two pretty unbelievable responses to this invitation. In real life, this would never really happen. A king throws a feast and, and people decide, no, I'd, I'd rather work hard on my farm all day than go to this, this week-long feast. Now, that wouldn't happen. Receiving the messengers who are carrying the guest invitation and taking them and killing them, no, that wouldn't really happen either. But these two dramatic responses show exactly the type of response that the Lord gets to the invitation of his word today. Looking at the second one first, we see many people throughout the world who are physically angry when they hear God's word, who throughout history have, have killed the messengers when they killed and martyred prophets and people who were sent. And still today we see many people who become angry when we share God's word with them and will stop at nothing to try and find ways to persecute Christians. And that's one response to God's invitation. And thankfully we don't find ourselves in that category. But what about the other one? The other response that's of people who go to their farm or to their business, paid no attention and went off. That doesn't sound too different from us a lot of times. Every time the Lord comes to us in his word, he's extending this invitation. He's saying, come to my feast that I'm throwing for you for free. And how often do we see these opportunities to gather around his word and we say, well, Lord, I'd, you know, I'd come to church today, but I'm awfully tired. I'd rather, I just need to get my rest today. And Lord, I know that we're gathering around your word this morning, but you know, football is only 16 weeks out of the year. I can't miss that. Or Lord, I know I could be studying your word right now, but I really just need to relax. I need to go about my own business at this moment. Whatever the excuse is, we fit into this category the people who respond to God's invitation with just general disinterest. After all, we go to church on Sunday, the rest of the week, that's for us, isn't it? That's often how we think, at least in my case. And what is God's response? The king responds in verse 7. The king was angry, and he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Is that an overreaction? The Lord responding in this way to the people that he's given chance after chance after chance to hear his word? I'm not sure it is an overreaction. Actually, that's exactly what each one of us deserve. So who does he invite now? Starting at verse 8. Then the king said to his servants, The wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. And those servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they found both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. So he said the first were unworthy. Unworthy because they had rejected the invitation and chosen not to go. So he has lost this entire group of people. So who does he have to send it out to? 
He's made this entire feast. He wants to fill the hall. He sends his servants out to the countryside, to the streets, to find anyone they come across and say, hey, you are invited to come to my kingdom, to come and take, partake of the feast. It says they were invited the good and the bad. And we need to realize that that's in the servant's perspective. These servants are told, go out and give out the invitation to anyone you come across. So they give to some people who, in their eyes, appear to be pretty good, and other people who, in their eyes, they're saying, should I be inviting this person? They're not exactly good. And yet, in the king's eyes, all of them equally unworthy because he didn't originally send the message to them. All of them equally unworthy because, in his eyes, they're bad. They're sinful. And that's where we find ourselves. Recipients of this invitation. Unworthy recipients of this invitation. Now take note about just how absurd this entire scenario is. You have a king, he wants to fill his his wedding hall with guests, so he sends it out to the streets to get the homeless people, poor people, tax collectors, prostitutes, every single type of person that you could possibly gather together and find on the streets and bring them together to fill his hall for his son, the prince. That just wouldn't really happen. If you've ever been married or had to plan a reception, you know just how hard it is to figure out the guest list. You pour over names for hours. You decide you have too many names. You need to cut some people, but you already have the amount of people that you want, the exact right list, and you have to make some hard cuts. There's never room for people you don't know or people that you aren't friends with. And yet, that's exactly who the king is inviting. This king goes out and finds all manner of people that are foreign to him, sinful people, the worst type of filth that no one would want in their homes, much less their wedding hall. And he invites them. That's exactly what the Lord does for each one of us. The worst type of filth. People who were born in sin and doomed to die. People who were enslaved to sin. Yet the Lord says, invite them to my kingdom. Come to my wedding feast. And that would be a pretty good spot to stop the parable. The Lord inviting those who are unworthy like us into his wedding hall. But he goes on from there. It takes quite a turn here in verse 11. When the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, bind him hand and foot and cast him into outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. At first appearance, this is pretty shocking behavior on the part of this king. He sees a man who's come in there you know, from the streets, and he sees he's not wearing a suitable robe, and he binds him and throws him out. That's pretty cruel behavior. What if the man was poor and couldn't afford a wedding garment? What if the man didn't have any time and he had to come a long way so he didn't have any time to change and he just came in the clothes he was wearing? And yet the master ties him up and throws him out? That might be the, your first thought as you're reading this is how cruel this king can be. Except for your perspective will change when you know that in those days, the king, he's throwing the best feast for his people, for his son, and so he needed the people to be wearing the best. And what he would do he was he would actually provide the garments for the people to wear. And you can see this obviously to be the case because he's invited all these manner of people from the streets, and every single one of them wearing a wedding garment except for this one man. And when he accuses him of not having worn the garment that he was wearing, the man doesn't say, I'm too poor to afford one, or I couldn't go home to get it. The man doesn't have an excuse. Because there was none. The garment was provided, and the man refused. 
And so the Lord, or the king, binds him up and throws him outside. The Lord invites us to his wedding feast. Will he find us unsuitable? Will he see that what we're wearing is not good enough? Will he bind us up and throw us out? Well, if we were to approach the Lord by our own virtues, or to approach the Lord in heaven and say to him, Lord, I'm a good person. That's why you should let me into heaven. Well, that's approaching the Lord with your own clothes. And what you're doing is you're either overestimating your own goodness, or you're underestimating the perfection which the Lord demands. And it just won't be good enough. So how can we possibly stand in the Lord's wedding hall? How can we possibly stand before the Lord when we know exactly what we are? Thankfully, the king, the Lord, provides the wedding garments. He provided the garments of salvation through his son, Jesus Christ. He washed us in his blood on Calvary and cleansed us from all of our sins. He made us wear the spotless robes of his righteousness so that before the Lord, we do belong in spite of all those sins that threaten to keep us away from him. Yes, we find that in Jesus, we are worthy wedding guests. Now, I want to go back to that first question I asked you. Hopefully you've come to the right answer by now. If you're standing before the Lord on Judgment Day, and God looks at you and he says, why should I let you into heaven? What's your answer? What would you point to? If you could point to one thing above everything else, what would it be? For many in this world, the answer goes something like this. Oh, Lord, you should let me in because I'm a good person. Or it's, Lord, you should let me in because even though I know I sin, I still try my best and I give, give of myself to people and I volunteer my time. Or the answer might be something like, Lord, I go to church every Sunday. I've served you my entire life. What do you think about those answers? That's, I, believe in, in you. I believe in you. Absolutely correct. If we come to him with these answers, that's like coming with our own clothes and expecting that to be good enough. But rather, when the Lord says, why should I let you into heaven? Say, Lord, you should let me into heaven because of what you've done. Because you extended the invitation to me. Because you gave me the correct robes to wear. Because you died and took away my sins. Because you have washed me and cleansed me. Lord, because of what you've done, I deserve heaven. I believe in you. Now, we won't have to answer that question on Judgment Day, but it is a good illustration for us to keep in mind. Yes, we have been invited to the wedding feast. Who wouldn't want to go to that feast? And the Lord makes us worthy solely because of what he has done for us. Thanks be to God for this glorious invitation. Amen. Please rise. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all our human understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus.
may be seated for the next hymn, hymn 613, followed by the offering and the offering hymn. shall not stand forever, for that swift judgment and destruction shall overtake men when they least expect it. Enable us to stand unashamed before you in that day. Nothing we could do could possibly win your favor. Yet your love found the way, for you sent your only Son to atone for our sins. We rest our faith on your love, 
asking that you forgive us where we have transgressed and where our faith has wavered. Endless praise and thanks be to you, Father, for making us sinners acceptable in your sight through Jesus. O Savior Jesus Christ, by whose blood we are declared righteous, accept our humble praise. We live in a world that is utterly sinful and hostile towards God. It is filled with temptations that, with alluring appeals to our base, sinful flesh, we are constantly beset by sin on every hand. Our comfort and hope is in your glorious return, when you shall bring to an end all things here and receive us into the joys of your eternal home. We pray that you would come quickly, according to your words and promise, and that in the time remaining you would help us to apply our hearts and minds continually to heavenly wisdom, to a devout and diligent study of your word. Keep us from backsliding. Graciously preserve our first love from growing cold. Dwell in us through the Holy Spirit, that by his grace we might prove the sincerity of our faith and love with bountiful fruits of good works. And Holy Spirit, create in us humble hearts and lead us daily to repent of all our sins. Turn our thoughts continually from worldly matters to God and to his Son, Jesus Christ, who will come one day to take us to himself. Give us the strength to flee temptations and evil lusts. Lead our footsteps along the paths of righteousness, guided by the word. Fill our hearts with the love of Christ, so that we will in turn love each other. What great joy is ours as we look forward to the blessed day when our Savior and Lord will appear in glory to raise and judge the world. On that day, we shall finally be delivered from this veil of tears. May our joy never diminish and our faith never weaken. As the spirit of truth and divine counselor whom Christ promised to his church, strengthen us during this time of watching and waiting. Praise and honor to you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in whose name we also join together to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Receive with believing hearts the blessing of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Final four stanzas of the hymn 616. You may receive it. <laughs> 